Hello, this is Melissa Fleming, and I'm live today with the High Commissioner for Refugees, Filippo Grandi. In the chambers of the Security Council, Mr. Grandi just addressed the Security Council on and on behalf of over 66 million people who are uprooted. It's great to have you here, and we thought it would be really good to talk to Mr. Grandi about what he actually said to the council. So I'm going to ask you a few questions. Um, you spoke on behalf of all of the uprooted, and you said, have we become unable to broker peace? Why is it important to bring a humanitarian message to the, the council, the Security Council, that's responsible for peace and security in our world? Well, precisely because of that, the Security Council that sits here in this chamber um, is the place, is the most important place in the world where peace and security are discussed. And uh, refugees are a humanitarian issue. And my organization, UNHCR, is a non-political organization. We do humanitarian work, protection work. but. We depend on political action to find solutions to refugee problems. So my message today here was please stay focused on those difficult conflicts. Mm -hmm. Try to find, make efforts all together uh, to overcome your differences to try and find solution to the problems that cause the outflows of refugees. So that was an important message and I did say yes have we become unable to make peace? That was a provocative Why question. Why did you say that? It was a provocative mm -hmm. question, but it was also a question that mirrors a certain mm -hmm. reality. If you look at uh, the patterns of mm -hmm. conflict in the past 10, 20 years, they have become more serious, more difficult to resolve, and this means that the refugee crisis that they have provoked become very protracted become very protracted, and that's one of the reasons why we have such high numbers, 66 million people. But it's not only the protracted crises, the crises that the international community has not been able to solve, but you talked also in your talk about fresh crises, fresh new conflicts uh, that have erupted. Can you give us a little bit of an idea of who, you know, which countries you were talking about, which situations? We discussed um, um, very much the crisis of refugees from Myanmar, the right. Rohingya refugees mm -hmm. that are fleeing from the Rakhine state of Myanmar into Bangladesh. 600,000, more than 600,000 in, in two months. A human tragedy on a dramatic scale is what you called it. And I, and I uh, told them about my mm -hmm. recent visit, mm -hmm. about what I uh, saw, the despair, mm -hmm. the overcrowding, the difficult conditions, in the desperate conditions in which peop people live, and I urge them to continue to um, talk to Myanmar, the solution is of course in Myanmar from where these people come, to, uh, to recreate conditions for these people to go back. This was a very important aspect of the discussion, and this is the most uh, current, but also the most dramatic crisis that we are dealing with. Yeah, we just went out, you did a, a press stakeout uh, at the Security Council yeah. uh, press stakeout area, and that was basically all the press were asking about. What is the solution? What are the conditions that are required in order for the 600,000 Rohingya refugees, stateless refugees, to return back to Rakhine in Myanmar? 600,000 plus those that were, were already, already in Bangladesh right. from previous influxes, so maybe almost a million people. Of course, uh, like the Secretary General has said many times, uh, it is important that violence ceases in that area of Myanmar mm -hmm. called Rakhine, and it is important that humanitarian organizations like ours are given access to people again. Mm -hmm. That will stabilize the situation and create hopefully some confidence. But then there are very big issues to be addressed. Perhaps the most important is the citizenship issue. Mm. The Rohingya refugees are also stateless people. They have mean? not. They have not. They have no nationality, mm. no citizenship, and mm. this is a complex issue, very complex issue that needs to be addressed. Mm -hmm. So that's that's where I think uh, UNHCR, my organization, has a role to play mm -hmm. in support of mm. states, in support of Bangladesh, of course, which is receiving this big 
influx of refugees and has kept its borders open. Mm -hmm. We need to give Bangladesh recognition mm -hmm. for having uh, given hospitality to so many people in difficult circumstances, but also in support of Myanmar to uh, carry out these complex exercises that are necessary to recreate, as I said, conditions for people to go back voluntarily mm -hmm. and in a dignified manner. Right, and so uh, yeah, being stateless obviously uh, fuels uh, <coughs> discrimination. It, it is one of the biggest, pro I think there are 10 million stateless people in the world today, and the Rohingya are one of the biggest populations, if not the biggest. So we need to resolve that. You were recently at um, the border between Myanmar and Bangladesh, and you met uh, uh, refugees coming across, and you have told the Security Council and also other people about what you experienced there. What are some of the things that the refugees told you? Uh, well, I, what struck me most was so many children that told me about witnessing the killing of their parents. Mm -hmm. I don't think there is anything more traumatic for any child than the murder of his or her parents uh, w which they witness before I think their eyes. Before their eyes. Mm -hmm. I think, I think that I, I mm -hmm. saw several, not, not one or several. two, many children. Uh, I saw many women who had mm -hmm. been raped or had tried to resist violence and had been wounded in the process. I assume that unfortunately others have been killed. And, uh, and many other people who had either witnessed or suffered violence. So like I said many times before, one of the main aspects of this emergency response mm -hmm. is to provide healing to those psychological wounds that people have suffered. I think that uh, as we move on and hopefully we improve the material assistance mm -hmm. that we provide mm -hmm. to refugees, um, we will remain with this big challenge which is to provide psychosocial support Absolutely. to the communities that have been affected so gravely by the violence there. Very good. Well, you also told the council, and I quote, when I meet refugees, their first question is not about food or shelter, but it is about peace and security, <coughs> because it is security and peace that will convince them to return home. And then you used the example of the terrible conflict in Syria that's already, that's still raging in its seventh year. Mm -hmm. What was your message to the Security Council about the situation in Syria? The message is that um, the conflict is not over. Mm -hmm. It has evolved. We have seen progress in the fight against ISIS, for example, mm -hmm. and some areas were liberated. We have seen um, um, some parts of the country becoming more stable. And uh, we have seen some of the displaced people inside Syria. There's, nobody knows, six, seven million. Some of them have gone back home although some others have been freshly displaced. So it's a very fluid situation. Well over a million. And uh, a small number of refugees, I think maybe 50,000, have also mm -hmm. returned. But it is still very small because people are still worried. They're not confident that if they go back, mm -hmm. they'll find, once again, that security, which really is the main precondition for them to go back home. So my message today to the council was when you pursue uh, political tracks mm -hmm. and hopefully get closer to peace in Syria after uh, six, seven years of war, don't forget that there is a huge dimension of people in exile outside or inside Syria. And deal with that matter with prudence. Don't force returns. Don't, um, don't uh, urge people to go back if they're not ready because Precipitated returns will be destabilizing, but if we wait for the right time, voluntary, dignified returns will be a big contribution to peace. That was my strong message to the Security and Council. And in the meantime, your other message was there are five million Syrian refugees in the neighboring countries who have generously hosted them for all of these years, and yet the funding yeah. situation is we're, we're something like it's 2017 and we're in November and our budget is only something like 46 percent funded. What does that mean? And, and you, I recall in 2015 at the London conference 
there were all of these pledges of um, you know, grand support for the Syrians living in the neighboring countries and the communities and the countries hosting them. Where do we stand now? Yeah, the London conference almost two years ago came at a time when Syrian refugees were pouring into mm -hmm. Europe. So there was a lot of attention and a lot of very good commitments made which were honored. And mm -hmm. you know, the situation did improve in the areas of education, for example, or mm -hmm. employment. That momentum should not end. Right. And we should uh, remember that uh, the countries neighboring Syria continue to host more than five million refugees, have hosted them patiently, generously, for so many years, I'm talking about Lebanon, small country, Jordan, a country with few resources, Turkey, that is the largest refugee hosting country in the world because of the Syrian problem. So those countries, we need to continue to support them until the time comes for return. You also said, you said that very clearly in your speech, but you also said that you're concerned that some of the wealthier countries, the countries that are less impacted by refugee inflows, are reacting by closing their borders, restricting asylum. Um, what, what did you say to that? What was your message there? My message is that in the statement to the Council, I pointed out that if they, members of the Council, had gone out to see refugees, and many of them have, they would have certainly met people that have gone through very difficult journeys to seek safety. And encountered a lot of problems, trauma, violence mm -hmm. along this way, and sometimes they come at the door of safety and they're mm -hmm. pushed back. Mm -hmm. And so my appeal is very strong that, of course, we need to look at the root causes. Of course, we need to create solutions for people to go back home safely. But meanwhile, we need to maintain generosity mm -hmm. and solidarity towards refugees. And that solidarity is not only of a few countries that happen to be next to the war, mm -hmm. next to the conflict, it has to be shared globally. Everybody has to share because refugees are an international responsibility. Which was acknowledged here in the United Nations General Assembly last year uh, at the General Assembly meeting. And the result was the New York Decl Declaration on Refugees and Migrants. Countries um, yes. reacting here mentioned today. it today towards uh, the global compact on refugees. Do you see the work that's being done and will be presented here at the United Nations uh, next September and hopefully adopted? Do you see this as a game changer, a new blueprint for addressing refugee uh, issues? Yes, this is not a set of new norms. All mm -hmm. the norms on how to deal with refugees are, exist already. This is as you said, the new blueprint on how to respond better, more yes. effectively to the plight of refugees in this day and age yes. with these long conflicts, protracted refugee situation. For example, we need to invest more in refugee education. Yes. For example, we need to do more for yes. communities hosting refugees sometimes for 10 years, 20 years. Those are areas that we have neglected. And I think this uh, compact that we're working on will favor more support in those areas. For example, big development actors like the World Bank, some bilateral development agencies are coming in with new resources and new approaches that I think can really be a game changer. That's why I was very happy. Yesterday I was in the General Assembly, today here mm -hmm. in the Security Council to hear a lot of support from all member states for this process. And I look forward to that global compact as an important umbrella, an important reference framework that will help us mm -hmm. really improve the way we deal with refugee crisis. Okay, well, I just want to, with my last question, um, talk about some of the really, really strong messages that you delivered here, and I'm allowing myself to quote them because they were so strong. One, you said, the sharp rise in, in forced displacement reflects weaknesses in international cooperation and declining capacity to prevent, contain, and resolve conflicts. Another message was competing interests are being pursued through proxy wars instead of being resolved through dis diplomacy and dialogue. Third message, key message in this area was the focus on short-term interests rather than long-term collective stability 
Uh, you said that that is undermining peace and security. How did members of the Security Council react to these strong messages? I think that uh, they agreed. They know the gaps, the inadequacies of the international system. Mm -hmm. uh, individually, they know that. What is sometimes difficult in the Security Council, in this uh, international forum, is to find unanimity. Mm. Look at Syria, for example. How long did it take for all the members to come up mm. with resolutions on which they all agreed to move forward the peace process and hence the solution mm. to the refugee question? So I think that the role of people like me, humanitarian workers mm. coming here to the Security Council, to this very high level forum for peace and security is to remind them that if they don't find that unanimity, if they don't uh, find the energy to achieve peace, those who suffer are men, women, and children, the ones we are dealing with. So my role is to remind them of that. I'm glad they invited me again mm -hmm. because I'll do it again, and hopefully this will help a little bit move the discussion towards positive conclusions. On that note, thank you very much, Mr. Grandy, for joining us. And thank you thank to our you. Facebook friends for tuning in. We'll be back.